All righty, you can be seated this morning. It is good to have you here. Uh, once again, thank you so much for your generosity to BGMC, to our church. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, today, well, uh, I, I was under the understanding we were getting rid of daylight savings time, but uh, apparently that didn't go through or didn't pass. I don't know what happened, but someone needs to speak to their senators and everybody else. So, uh, But we will survive and we will make it uh, through the power of coffee and the Holy Spirit. So, uh, I grew up in church. Most of you know that my dad is a pastor. I've been in ministry around 20 years now and uh, just through life, and I'm sure some of you have, have been on the receiving end of, of one of those calls that none of us like to get. Maybe there's been an accident, or maybe there's been a health emergency, but you, you get a call or you get a text, you get some information, and you hear that someone is in critical condition. You know, you hear, you get that call that, oh, someone had a health emergency. You know, I, in hospice world, we get some of those calls where it's like, hey, we need to get over there. They're in critical condition. And that critical, we know that the next few moments, we know that the next few minutes and hours and maybe just the next few days are vitally important to what's going to happen in that person's life. It is a, a critical situation. It's a vital time. And I would submit to us this morning that we are in same, some critical stages when it comes to the mission of the church. We have a world that is deteriorating around us. We have a culture that's deteriorating around us. We have a people who are hurting, people who are broken. And the mission of the church and what God has called you and me to do has never been more urgent. It's never been more necessary. We are at a critical time in history when it comes to us fulfilling the mission of God. The thing I love about God is he relies on the Holy Spirit and the church. We are the hope of the world through Jesus Christ working in us. It isn't McDonald's that's gonna save people. It isn't Wells Fargo or anybody else. It's the local church fulfilling the call of God on our lives to do the work of the Lord. And so this morning, we're a part of, most of you know this, we're an Assemblies of God church. And the Assemblies of God, we were a part of what's called the Iowa Ministry Network. There are 120 Assembly of God churches in Iowa. I believe there's 15,000 churches worldwide. But in Iowa, we have 120 churches and about 500 credentialed ministers and the mission of the Iowa Ministry Network is this. I love our mission. It's, it's on the screen and it's in your notes. It's this. We exist to champion local churches and leaders to urgently fulfill the Great Commission. I like that word, urgently. This is a mission that we can't continue to put off. We have a tendency in life to put things off, don't we? Exercise, anybody else here? We put things off. Well, I'll do that one day. I'll start saving one day. I'll start doing that one day. And sometimes if we're not careful, we do the exact same thing with what God has called us to do, which is to reach the lost. But he tells us our, our mission and as the network is to urgently fulfill the Great Commission. The Assemblies of God started in 1914. And when they gathered together for the very first time, here's what they said. They said that this is our mission. We commend ourselves. This is who we want to be. And the movement, the Assemblies of God, we commend ourselves and the movement of the Assemblies of God to him for the greatest evangelism the world has ever seen. That's what we're supposed to be about. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's what the Assemblies of God wants to be, that we are full of people who are urgently fulfilling the Great Commission. If you have a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 28. I know most of you know these verses. Matthew 28, Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, and he speaks to his disciples, and he leaves them with this charge, with this what we call commission. Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. Jesus gathers them and he says to them in verse 18, then Jesus came to them, the disciples, and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. 
That's the great commission. That's the call of every single person who calls themselves a believer of God. It isn't just for pastors. It isn't just for Sunday school teachers. It isn't just for church leaders. It's for every single person who calls themselves a Christian. We're all called to help fulfill the great commission. So let's talk a little bit about what needs to happen in order for us to do that. First off, we need to start with this question. The first question, we're gonna answer three questions today. The first question is this, are we ready? Are we ready? If we're not ready, how are we gonna help the world get ready? Do we understand how this works? Lost people don't reach lost people. <laughs> it takes people who have been found by the grace of God, whose lives have been changed to go out and to share that and spread that to everyone that they know. Lost people don't reach lost people. Go, if you have a Bible, to Matthew chapter 25. Jesus tells this really interesting parable. He's talking about the end times, the day and the hour are unknown. And then he tells us this interesting parable. And he's going to speak in some, some interesting terms, but he, he likens the return of Christ to the bridegroom, which is Jesus, who will be coming back and coming to these people. And, and he says that there are five wise virgins and five foolish virgins. Then he tells us this story about the bridegroom's going to be coming. There's five wise and five foolish. The five wise, they have oil for their lamp. They're ready. They're prepared. Then there are five foolish virgins who do not have oil ready. And so at midnight, it tells us in this story that the bridegroom comes. We know Jesus is going to come at an hour that's unknown. There's going to be a delay. He's going to come and there'll be five that are ready and five that are, are not ready. The five that are not ready start to ask the five that are ready and say, hey, can we have some of your oil? We need some of your, your oil so that we can go to this banquet, to this wedding banquet. And they tell them, we can't do that. Now, we have to be careful to rely on other people's faith to get us into heaven. I grew up in the church. My mom and dad are pastor, or my dad's a pastor, and my dad's faith cannot get me into heaven. My wife's faith cannot get me into heaven. My faith cannot get my children into heaven. It can help them, but ultimately, I'm responsible for my life, and I have to be ready. It tells us that they were not, that, that there were five that were ready. They went to the banquet, and the others, it tells us that they did not get to go in, that they were shut out forever. And so he reminds us, we have to be ready. So the first challenge that we have to, we have to clear up before we go any further is just, are we ready? Is it, when you look at your own life, are you ready? Are you serving the Lord in the way that you know that you're supposed to serve, serve the Lord according to what we know through scripture? So are we, we ready? Now I want you to go to um, Matthew chapter 23. The second question we're gonna ask ourselves today is this question, are we hindering people from coming to the Lord? Are we hindering? This is one that we need to be real careful and real thoughtful about this morning. Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 is giving some warnings to the religious leaders. It's really a warning to hypocrites. Has anybody in here ever been a hypocrite before? Okay, four of us, okay. Um, no, we, we all have been hypocrites before in our lives. And, and look what it says in verse number 13. He's gonna give seven woes. He's warning the, these people and he, he, he warns the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. And he says this, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Listen, if Jesus calls you a hypocrite, it's probably not a good day, okay? You don't want Jesus to be calling you a hypocrite. So he calls them hypocrites. Then he says this, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who enter who are trying to. So here's these religious people who should have known better, who should have lived their lives uh, according to God's word. These Pharisees and, and teachers of the law, they knew the 613 laws from the Old Testament backward and forward. They could tell you, what does it say about this spotless animal? What does it say about what sacrifice you're supposed to make for your sin? What sacrifice are you supposed to make for this? They, they could tell you all of those things. 
And yet here they are, and he says that they're shutting the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. I've, I've grown up, like I said, in church, and, and I myself, I'm sure there have been times where I've been guilty of being, sometimes we can be too harsh with people. Has anybody ever been too harsh with someone when it comes to their faith? And, and sometimes we might even have good intentions and, and we're trying to help people get their lives right before the Lord, but we can come across as really harsh. Another way that we come across is really religious. Have you ever met a really religious person before? Sometimes really religious people, they feel like they're goalkeepers. And so what they do is there's a goal behind them and they're keeping everybody out of heaven. They're gonna do whatever they can do to block anyone who they don't deem as worthy to get into heaven. And so they stand at the goal and they keep everybody out. That's not what God is calling us to do. God doesn't want us to stand there. He wants us to, to help people get in, not to hinder people from coming in. The other, the other side of being too harsh is, just quite honestly, is lying to people. Saying you can live however you want to and go to heaven. So we have people who are, who are harsh and religious and they tell, here's the 80 million rules you gotta do to get into heaven. Then there's these other people who say, you can do whatever you want to, Jesus loves you no matter what. And so there's this false understanding in their mind, I can do whatever I want, but Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's a fine line that we need to, a delicate walk that we have as Christians we need to be responsible and we need to be loving to people. I, I try to, and, and I know I don't always get this right, but I try to always have relationships where I'll still have influence with people. In other words, I don't wanna come across just too harsh and push, push someone so far away that they have no relationship with me that I could ever lead them to the Lord. I wanna be in a position in my life where when maybe we don't have the greatest relationship or maybe I've had to tell them a hard truth, but I did it in a loving way with compassion that when life hits them hard, that one day they could come and feel like they have a place to come and, and they're gonna receive love and grace through me to help them know who the Lord is. I don't think there's anybody in this room who would ever want to do anything to hinder anybody else coming to know the Lord. We have to be thoughtful. We have to be careful of how we live and what we do. The last question is this, are we making God accessible? Now, this morning in Sunday school, Danny almost stole my whole message. And luckily he, he didn't get all the way there. But in, in Acts chapter 15, if you have your Bible, turn there really quick. Acts chapter 10, we really see the gospel starts to spread to the Gentiles. The Jewish people have been told their whole lives that they're the people of God. And so they have this kind of mark on them. They were the people of God. God did call them out to be separate and holy. But what happened was is sometimes because they were the people of God, they thought that they were the only ones that God loved or cared about. They were the only ones who God would give access to him. And so in Acts chapter 15, they have this with this council at Jerusalem and they're, they're making this decision because in the Old Testament, one of the ways God established a covenant with the people of God was through circumcision. And so when he did that, it was this covenant that he made that if, if, if you do this, then, then you're marked, you're, you're part of the kingdom of God. And these, these leaders in, in Acts chapter 15 are trying to figure out what that looked like for the early church and what they needed to do or what they didn't need to do. And there were some people who said, absolutely, you need to do this act of covenant with the Lord in order to be a follower of God. And then there were others saying, we're seeing Gentiles come to know the Lord. They're being baptized, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we're seeing God work amongst them. And, and so here's what it says in Acts chapter 15, verse number six. They're having this discussion. It says the apostles and the elders met to consider this question. Really, it was about kind of that Old Testament covenant, Old Testament law. And verse number uh, seven says, after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Verse 10, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks 
of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. You see, they wanted to put the law on these people and say, hey, you have to follow these 613 laws. You have to be circumcised. You have to do these things in order to, and there's a new church, there's new people who are coming to the Lord, the Gentiles. And so they're having this discussion and then it continues to go on. And and in verse, we're gonna look at verse number 19. They're having this discussion continues to go on that we see this quote of, of the book of Amos, which is why Danny brought it up because he's teaching in the book of Amos in Sunday school. And then we see this in verse number 19. They say, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, what they were saying was, we wanna make it accessible for the Gentiles to enter into the kingdom of God. We don't want to put a bunch of rules on them. We don't want to say they have to do all these things. But these people are coming to know the Lord through the preaching of the gospel, the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They've been saved. We've seen them be baptized in water. We've seen them be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We cannot make it difficult. And I would say that's what the mission of the church is supposed to be today. We should have the same mentality. It should be our judgment that we should not make it difficult for anyone who is turning to God. We just shouldn't. So how do we make God accessible to people? How do you and how do I make God accessible to the people in our lives? Well, the first thing is this. We, it, it goes to how we live. How do you live your life? Living according to the word of God. You know, in the Old Testament, they had the law of Moses. In the New Testament, we see the law of Christ, which are the teachings of Christ in the gospels. How we live is really, really important. That, you know, he rebukes the hypocrites, the, those people who, who might come to church on Sundays and then live a completely different way during the week. He's speaking and he's saying he, he wants us to live our lives in such a way that's worthy of the gospel. But how we live our life is important. How you conduct yourself is important. How you behave when you're at work. How you behave when you're with your family. How you handle yourself. Are we living for the Lord? Are we representing the Lord by the way that we're living our life? You know, we see uh, in, in Galatians chapter five, it talks about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Is that what people are seeing in our lives? Are they seeing anger and bitterness and unforgiveness? What are they seeing in our lives? Are they seeing us behave in, in sinful ways? How we live is, is important. You know, there used to be this saying that you saw, it was probably in the early 2000s, maybe late 90s, that your life is the only Bible people will ever read. Have you ever heard that one before? Right, and what we know the essence of what they're saying is, hey, before people ever read through the word of God, they're probably gonna look at Christians. They're probably gonna see you live your life. And so when you're working your job every single day, when your kids see you at home, which that's just altogether convicting in and of itself, but how we live our lives in front of people and before God is vitally important. We make God accessible to people by showing them how to live their life by the way that we live our life. The second thing is this, by inviting people in. We invite people in. We, we let people know there's a seat at the table. The Gentiles had no clue or no understanding that there was a seat at the table for them when it came to Jesus. Jesus gave them access that they never had before. And so we wanna be people who are inviting people into the kingdom of God, not shutting it in the faces like the, the religious leaders and the, the, the teachers of the law. We wanna be people who are inviting people. You've probably heard me say it before, nine out of 10 people are gonna to come to church because one of you invited them, not because I invited them. 90% of people are gonna come because you got out of your seat and you went to a coworker, a friend, a family member, a neighbor, and you invited them to church. <laughs> one way we wanna make it easier and accessible for you is, you men Jason mentioned it earlier, through these cards, we're, we're making it a little bit easier for you. We printed up these really nice cards. They have a way for you to connect with someone, hand it to someone at work, put it on a, a table at work, put it in the mail to someone, take a screenshot of it and send it to a friend. We wanna make it easy for you to invite people to church. 
But one way we make God accessible to people, it's how we live. And, and part of the way is by inviting them in. Hey, there's a seat for you, no matter how much you feel like you've messed up or how far away from God you feel this morning. Thirdly and lastly is this, as we tell them our story. You know what I love about the church is every single person in this room has a different story. I grew up in church. I made mistakes all along the way. Many of you, some of you grew up in church and the first Sunday you were alive, you were at church. Others of you were adults when you came to know who the Lord was. You came through maybe more, a more difficult road or, or through a road that was um, paved for you through maybe how you were brought up in your home. But we all have a story. We all have a testimony. We all have a way that God saved us from our sin. And one of the, one of the ways you and I make God accessible is by telling our stories. Everybody loves a good story. That's why we watch movies. That's why we watch shows. That's why we, 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 we hang out with the people that we do. We, we love to be around people who tell good stories. But telling the story of our faith, that's one of the ways to say, man, if, if God can, I don't know if you ever feel this way, if God can save me, he can surely save you. We gotta tell people our story. That's how we make God accessible to people. You know, here at first, we, we, we say this. Our, our mission here is we exist to help people know God find community, discover purpose, and make a difference. We want to we wanna help people know God. We want to help them receive salvation. We want to lead them to the Lord. We want to help to disciple them. We want to help provide a place where they can worship, a place where they can grow. And so we, we, we want to help people know God and, and who he is and his goodness. You know, we were singing that song this morning about the goodness of God. Many of us in this room can sing about the goodness of God because we've experienced the goodness of God. And so it's easy for us to sing about it. Find community. We were never meant to do, do life alone. If you've ever lived a life kind of apart from relationships, apart from friendships, apart from letting people really in and know you, you know how hard it is and how difficult and how lonely that road is. Wednesday night, we are going through our uh, emotional uh, maturity series. And w one, of the, one of the 10 things that he talked about is so important in our lives is having godly people in your life who know everything about you. You don't have to have 55 people. Not everybody in this church is gonna know who you are, know everything about you, but find one or two. Find some people that you can call and you can be real with. You can make fun of each other. You can pray with each other. You can be honest with each other about your struggles. But we find community, we find people, godly people, people that we can belong in and grow in our faith with. And then we discover purpose. Every single person in this room has a purpose for why you were born. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. We all have purpose, every single one of you, no matter what your age is, whether you're young or whether you're old, if you're still alive, God still has a purpose for your life. And when we discover what that purpose is, it makes life so much more meaningful, which leads to the last one, which is making a difference. It's one thing to know that God's put you on this earth for a reason. It's a whole nother reason, or it's a whole nother thing when you begin to make a difference in people's lives and use and leverage who God has made you and the giftings he's given you to impact people's lives. One of the things I love about the Assemblies of God, I love about missions is we're trying to make an impact in people's lives. The money that you gave this morning will go to WorldServe to help them make an actual impact in their lives. It's not just going in our bank account. It's going to change lives. A lot of you have taken eggs off of the Lenten tree that's out in the foyer. You've taken eggs and you've went and you've spent your hard-earned money and you've put it on the table, something that you want to make a difference in people's lives. Maybe it's just through the, the conversations you have at work. Maybe it's an encouraging word. You're trying to make a difference in people's lives. Here's what I know. We're living in some, some challenging times right now. And I don't believe that the mission of God has been any more critical than it is right now. Every day and every second that goes by is closer to the return of Jesus Christ. And so one, we have to be ready. Every one of us in this room is gonna give an account. Okay, Melissa's not gonna ride on my coattails to get into heaven. She has to have her own faith. 
My kids have to have their own faith. I want to be someone that's not just ready. I don't, I don't want to be a person who's hindering people from coming to the Lord. Let's be thoughtful. Some of us, let's just be honest. Some of us have been really harsh to people in the past. We've maybe put rules on them. We've maybe done things. And it's hindered them coming to know the Lord. Can I just encourage you? Maybe you need to reach out to them and, and ask for forgiveness. So you know what, man, I spoke to you in a really harsh way. I said some things that I really shouldn't have said. We don't want to be, none of us in this room, I know that that's not the heart of anybody. None of us want to hinder anyone coming to the Lord. But one thing that we have to do in this day and in this time is we have to make God accessible to people. Just like those kids in Africa need clean water, people need Jesus and we need to make him accept, accessible to them. I'm gonna ask Diane if she would, she would come forward. And You know, one of the most important things we, we wanna offer every person who walks through the doors of our church is the opportunity to receive salvation. It's the opportunity to connect with God, to know God. And the very first part of knowing God is really receiving salvation that he gives us through his son, Jesus Christ. Earlier, we asked the question, are we ready? I grew up... <laughs> hearing phrases, you know, like, you know, if Jesus came today, are you sure you would make heaven your home? The question still applies today. Are you living your life right now, March 10th, 2024, in a way that's pleasing to the Lord? We don't want to be like those five foolish virgin, virgins. We want to be like the five wise. We're ready. We're prepared. So this morning, if you're here and you're, you're just not living for the Lord, you're far away from God. You know it this morning. God knows it. There's no reason to, to pretend anything. We want to practice authenticity, which we just want to be real with one another. And, and we want to be real with God. So this morning, first and foremost, I want us to be people who would just say, hey, in just a moment, I'll give you an opportunity to, to pray. This Easter season, this time of year is one of the best times of year to invite someone to church and to be a part of a life-giving faith community. I want to be praying for you and I want you to be praying for people that God might put across your path that don't know him that you can help make accessible through your life, through inviting people and through your story. We want to see, we want to see people come to know the Lord this Easter season. I want you to bow your head just in your seat where you are. Now, this is a, a personal decision that we, we believe everyone needs to make on their own. No one can make it for you. But it's a decision to follow Jesus. Just like the disciples, he said, come, follow me. That's the same invitation to you today. Come, follow me. We're not placing any rules on you. We're not saying you have to do these 613 laws to follow Jesus. We're simply saying, come follow Jesus. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll make you right. He'll give you eternal life in him through faith in Jesus. Everyone's head is bowed. Please, if you would close your eyes, just to be sensitive to those who God is just stirring their hearts. If you find yourself here and you'd say, so honestly, I'm not ready, but I wanna be ready. Will you slip your hand up this morning so I can be praying for you? I'm not ready, but I want to be ready. I'm not ready, but I want to be ready. Okay. Okay. Let's stand together this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward this morning. We're going to, we're going to close out service this morning with a worship song talking about our belief in who God is. We're gonna sing a song called, We Believe. And it really just is kind of about what we as a church believe about the Lord, the proclamations and declarations of who he is. I'm gonna pray and then, and then we'll, we'll close with this song. Lord, we thank you for everyone who's here, God. Lord, based on Lord, our response this morning, we were people who are, were ready for you. Every day, help us to be more ready. 
But God, let us walk in wisdom. Let us walk in truth. Let us walk as people who are inviting people and loving people enough, caring about them enough to bring them and invite them to church. Lord, let our church have just a a culture of invitation where we think about our coworkers in a different way. We think about our, our friends. We think about our family members. Think about our neighbors in a different way because of the salvation that you've given to us. Lord, help us to be men and women who are urgently fulfilling the Great Commission, part of a group of people who want to be a part of the greatest evangelism the world has ever seen. God, help us to fulfill the Great Commission for your name and for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this song together as we close.